Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press. With me I have Susan Lindquist from the Whitehead Institute and MIT. Susan, welcome to Cold Spring Harbor. Thank you, it's delightful to be here again. Well, I, I feel that first of all I should congratulate you because I understand you were recently elected as a foreign member of the Royal Society. I was, yeah, so it was a, quite a kick. So that's <laughs> I a, must admit it's lovely. So that makes you a, a, a member of the Royal Society mm -hmm. and the National Academy. Yeah. So which, which has the best perks? Oh, I have yet to discover <laughs> what the Royal Society is going <laughs> to do for me. They're both really uh, just amazing institutions to be part of. I feel very honored by both. Well, congratulations. Thank you. Um, now, later on this evening, you're going to be talking about um, your work on yeast, looking into Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease and various other conditions. So I guess my first question is, is that Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, complex neurological conditions that affect us, multicellular organisms with nerves. Uh, yeast is a single-celled um, organism, uh -huh. no nerves. So, so what's the logic behind Absolutely. that? Absolutely. It sounds crazy, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and believe me, a lot of people thought I was crazy. Uh, and we didn't have an easy time of it in the beginning, but it was based upon the fact that I've been working on protein folding for a very long time. I know a lot about it. And I, it's a problem that's kind of universal amongst all living organisms. Mm -hmm. And I, my laboratory has worked over the years on fruit flies and uh, mustard plants and mice and human cells. And we, there's so much, so many aspects of it, protein folding and protein trafficking, uh, protein homeostasis, that they're just very highly conserved, very ancient problems. So I thought it was worth a try. Uh, and one of the motivating factors, well, there's really, really two motivating factors. One is that I know that these, these um, organisms are just capable of, of being a discovery platform that you can move in much, much more quickly than, mm -hmm. than you can in other conventional uh, cells and tissues. And the other is that we just really have got to solve these problems because they, the um, magnitude of, of them is, is staggering. As we've been curing other diseases, we've been living longer and longer lives and that's just absolutely great. But it's come, going to be coming at a terrible cost because as we live longer, more and more of us are going to be getting Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they're already in, in the United States alone. There are five million people suffering from Alzheimer's. When you consider the cost personally to the individual, because these last for years, these diseases, mm -hmm. the cost to the family, emotional cost, the devastation economically, and and our country just can't sustain this 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 healthcare problem. So. It's, it's something that I think is, is just imperative that we find a solution to. And so far, we haven't found a solution to it using conventional right. conventional approaches. So I thought it was, it's a kind of an out-of-the-box idea, but it was not based on fantasy. It was based upon my right. knowledge of, of some of the conserved processes. So, so I guess so, so the underlying sort of scientific idea is that just like... Uh, Randy Sheckman went looking in the in yes. used for secretory pathways because yes. they were conserved. Paul Nurse did it for cell cycle. Yeah. So your notion is that the um, the flaws in cells in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's are, are fundamental and we will be recapitulated right. in yeast too. Right, and at least in terms of those initiating pathologies, as what's happening as these proteins are going to the wrong places and misfolding, um, I, there will of course be all kinds of very complex aspects of the biology that will, will, could only be recapitulated in a living nervous system. Uh -huh. But uh, those, if, if those aspects of it that can be studied in yeast are, are really quite broad, and it, the proof is in the pudding. It, it has worked for us, uh -huh. and, and we've been finding, uh, been able to clarify a lot of um, murky factors about the genetics, and we've been able to find comp chemical compounds that rescue not only yeast but rescue human neurons. Mm -hmm. So um, we're charging on and we're doing more and more all the time with this. So, so. So what do you do to the yeast cells in the first place to get them to mimic yeah, the pathology? Uh, very simple. We take these genes that are prone to misfolding in human beings and are found in the brain in big blobby aggregates. Uh -huh. okay? And for quite a long, for many years, it wasn't quite sure of the fact that those blobs were in any way causative or whether they, they were just a bystander of, of other pathologies. But now it's really become clear in most instances that they are really intimately involved in the in the causation of the diseases. Right. So these and are so, things like amyloid beta yeah, in a beta, TDP43 for ALS, uh, alpha-synuclein for, for Parkinson's and MSA. And so we take those 
just the coating region. Mm -hmm. And we stitch it up to a promoter that we can turn on or off in a yeast cell. So we can um, transform the cells and do everything we want with the cells while they're still perfectly ha happy and healthy. And then when we want to study what's going to go wrong, we switch it into a different media, turn on the promoter. Every cell turns it on at exactly the same time and exactly the same way, so you get this incredibly synchronized uh, uh, onset of the pathology. And that really helps a lot, having that kind of synchronization and having that kind of speed. And so we then can, um, for example, the first thing we did was to look genetically to see what would rescue the cells. Because at that stage, it could have all just been blown up in our face, and we could have been just looking at non-specific protein aggregation problems, and, and that could there could have been interesting things coming out of that, but but not really things that we were aspiring to. You know, really, mm -hmm. really things that were disease specific and that would make it might make a difference to so, neurons. So, so you are seeing. So if you if you look at amyloid beta as opposed to tau or huntington or alpha synuclein, yeah. you see different things. Completely happening. different genes will rescue oh. them, and we get different phenotypes. Uh, there are some relationships, for example, alpha synuclein uh, causes problems in the movement of vesicles, these little packages uh, that contain things like neurotransmitters in neurons, and they contain things like mating factors in yeast. These little things that are moving around the cell and, and uh, get made in the endoplasmic reticulum and then wind up through a series of complex arrangements uh, being secreted from the cell. And then another cell picks up the signal and takes it in and responds, etc. So that's, that's um, a process that's very highly conserved. And we find that for both A-beta and for, for alpha-synuclein, aspects of the vesicle trafficking are uh, disturbed, but they're different ones. Right. And they're really very different. And then when we look at Huntington or TDP43, those are completely different from both of the others. So, uh, and of course, the proof is that this might matter was it was it was a very difficult moment when we went to having all these interesting genetic results in yeast and not knowing whether they would actually matter to mm -hmm. a neuron. So that was there was a period there where we were kind of really holding our breath uh, and then we wound up finding out two different things. One was that when we expressed the genes that rescued yeast cells, when we expressed those neurons from a nematode or from rat cortical neurons and, and now in human neurons they rescue those nerve cells from the phenotypes that are precipitated by those proteins. So and it really is that's, conserved. That's one real way of demonstrating. And then the other way uh, that's really kind of complementary is that as the genetics on human disease are getting better and better and we're understanding more and more of the proteins that when mutated are contributing factors to these diseases, well lo and behold, when we look at our gene lists, there's a lot of matches. So it, it, it kind of goes both ways. We, we get some information from the, from the human genetic studies, uh -huh. and then we show that that works in the yeast, and, and then the yeast allows us to understand the biology of that a lot more, and then we go back into the human cells, and sure enough, we, we find that the biology we discovered plays out too. So. so you pick up all the modifiers in that way? We pick up a lot of them that way, uh -huh. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, in your, in your abstract, you said that you were modeling some of this computationally. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit more about mm -hmm. that? Mm -hmm. We've been, it's, it's very interesting because there, um, there have been, in yeast, because it's such an unbelievably easy organism to work with, and because it has so many conserved processes, uh, and, and because there's just certain features of the biology of the organism that make it unbelievably good for genetics. So there have been tens of thousands of genome-wide screens in, done in yeast. That means tens of thousands of screens in which uh, something is perturbed or something is done and you search every gene in the genome for how it affects it. And that means that there's this dense connected network of genes th that you can play, you can tap into that mm -hmm. by making these new perturbations that we're, we're introducing. So that's one aspect of it. We get these, get these genetic maps where we, we connect the genes functionally and then uh, we take advantage of, of the fact that, that we can now, there are much more sophisticated programs for finding homologs of the yeast genes in human cells. So we not only do amino acid sequence matching, but there are now programs based upon threading structures of proteins onto previously known structures from human cells. Uh, and then there's something called neighborhood analysis, wherein you, you might not be quite sure if this is the homolog or not the homolog, but if two of the other genes it connects to in yeast 
are clearly homologs of two other genes in humans that are clearly homologs, then you know that that's probably is the right homologue. So that relies on an understanding of the protein-protein interaction yeah. networks. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So so and then and that's exactly the, the, the final piece is the, the dense amount of protein-protein interaction networks. There's there's a lot of protein-protein interaction uh, knowledge in humans too that we can take and mm -hmm. take advantage of. There's the, the genetic uh, understanding of gene relationships is at a very primitive state in, in human beings right now, but um, that allowed us to actually create computational maps transposing the yeast, the yeast relationships which we were being able to understand now into this human genetic network and connecting those, those genes in the, into meaningful relationships. Mm -hmm. And so we found, for example, uh, what I'll be talking about tonight is we found in, in terms of Parkinson's disease, there have been um, genes implicated uh, through genetic analysis that didn't seem to have too much to do with each other. It was kind of mysterious and people wondered whether, well, the real reason why they just happened to hurt dopaminergic neurons and therefore it gave a Parkinsonian phenotype, but they really weren't related. But in yeast, we see the connections because when we uh, overexpress alpha-synuclein, that gene rescues and that gene rescues and that gene rescues. And those are the genes that are involved in human disease, but they're out in different different parts of the trafficking pathways or parts of metal ion homeostasis or calcium signaling, for example. And so have uh, there been surprises uh, other than there, that? There have been, there have been a, a lot of surprises. We, we were even able to connect in genes that have no homologs in yeast. So uh, there's a gene called LERC2 kinase, which is uh, uh, mutations in that are a common cause of, of Parkinson's disease, and there's absolutely no homolog in yeast. But it turns out that that protein is a late, later evolving function in humans. But it slotted, didn't slot into empty space. You know, it came in when, as it evolved, it evolved to work within an interacting oh, no. network was that right. was already there, right? Okay. Yeah. And so that network that it interacts with is already there in yeast. So we could actually, uh -huh. we could actually figure out where it was mapping and what it was interacting with and relating to that way. Oh so, wow, that's fascinating. Yeah. So you, you also, so you're also using this as a. Um, discovery system for uh, small molecules that yeah, might help Yeah, and I think that's really, that's potentially the thing that I'm really the most excited about. Um, I'm excited about a lot of <laughs> stuff, but that is really cool. So we um, we have been able, because it's yeast cells, they're easy to grow because they're, they're you manipulate them so easily, you turn all these genes on at exactly the same time, as I mentioned. Uh, we were able to screen more than 500,000 compounds for the ability to rescue the yeast cells from alpha mm -hmm. And we're still only in the beginning process of, of finding what the rescuing, finding that the rescuing compounds are saving neurons, but we've taken two of them and we've looked at them exhaustively and they work beautifully to rescue neurons. And then the, the real key thing here is that these are things called phenotypic screens. All we did was ask for things that would make the yeast cells better without right. trying to guess, oh, it's going to be this kinase or this thing right. and do it, what's it called, an, a target-based screen where you do it in isolated proteins. These, um, these diseases are so complex and it's such webs of interactions. We thought, let the cells tell us what makes so them better. So you weren't better. assuming anything yeah, when you went Yeah, let the cells in. tell you what makes them better. And phenotypic screening has in the past in the pharmaceutical industry returned some amazingly wonderful compounds. The reason the industry doesn't use it very much is that it's very hard to figure out what the heck the compound it's is doing. doing. <laughs> and if you don't know what it's doing, it's hard to run a clinical trial on it. Right. So we realize that yeast genetics are so good that they might be able to solve that problem. So we were able to take compounds, once we found out that they were working to rescue human neurons from a patient that had Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. uh, in fact rescued several different neurons from patients with Parkinson's disease. We then said, okay, this is worth the work, and we went back to yeast and used three different genome-wide screens to find the target. And you just can't do that kind of screening in any other organism right now. It's just not possible. Uh -huh. I hope, hope one day it will be possible in, in human cells. Right, right now it's not. And so um, we found, for example, one of the compounds we found hits a ubiquitin ligase, mm -hmm. and it activates that ubiquitin ligase. And that ubiquitin ligase is something that controls vesicle trafficking. alpha synuclein blocks vesicle trafficking. This compound activates vesicle trafficking, so it counteracts the toxicity. And lo and behold, when they got out the target, very highly conserved protein maps directly onto the human protein, and we were able to show that we are, the compound is in human cells, too, working in the same exact mechanism. 
Well, that, that, that's amazing. <laughs> that, that seems like a, a amazing uh, strides to try and solve a very important problem. I think so. I, I'm, I'm really hoping that we can expand this effort in a wide variety of ways. And I, 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 think, I think it's important. I think it can be done. I think it's, a, it's really an entirely different way of doing drug discovery in complex diseases. Uh -huh. um, so. Well, we wish you the very best of luck with that. Thanks very much for Thank talking you. to us. Thank you. And I wish me luck nice to for the you. patients, too. <laughs> I will do. <laughs> Thanks. Take care. I enjoyed, enjoyed the, the conversation. <laughs>